Good morning, everyone. I was, I was kind of uh, hesitating because I thought no one was going to talk more. <laughs> you are a hard act to follow, so I appreciate your uh, brevity this morning. The bar won't be quite so high. Uh, it's great to see you all again. It has been a wonderful conference. Again, uh, much, much gratitude to Norm and Diana and uh, everyone with the Life Raft group uh, for their hard work in putting on this Life Fest uh, event. I, I know you, like me, have learned a lot. I mean, being able to sit and speak with researchers, scientists, <coughs> physicians, to ask questions. It's not often we get to do that outside of being in those cold, sterile offices, uh, slightly terrified. And I want to thank the physicians for attending. I also want to thank our caregivers. Let's just give them a hand. Some of you have seen my son, AC, he's 27, who is here with me in spirit. He's in the room sleeping right now, but uh, <laughs> he, uh, he lives in his own home and he, he didn't quite know what I, I go through on a daily basis. So at least three days with me, seeing me with uh, abdominal pain and the running to the bathroom. Last night we were on the pier and I just broke out in a sweat and he got all alarmed and um, just trying to eat sometimes, and it's my new normal. I'm accustomed to it, and it's not until I see my life through someone else's eyes that I even uh, realize, you know, what a daily challenge it still is. It's amazing what you can get accustomed to. And finally, thank you to my brave new friends. You have all been so warm and so encouraging, and it just has lifted my spirit here. It, it is something to be diagnosed with a rare. Uh, chronic disease and trying to manage it and having so few people you can actually touch and talk to. Uh, there's no one in my area. I have to go to Dallas. So to be here with all of, all of you is an exclusive club. It's an, a, dif a difficult club to be part of, but we are, I feel like we are family. I shared a bit of my story with you on uh, Friday night when I was uh, emceeing the event that I was diagnosed in 2012 and um, didn't know much about cancer. I sure didn't know anything about GIST, so I went to the local oncologist there in Austin, and he said, we're gonna do surgery, and it's gastric, it was a 10 centimeter tumor, and we're gonna get you on Gleevec, and you'll be fine. So we did the surgery. A lot of you have had a similar story. Uh, waited a few weeks, I went on Gleevec, our medication of choice, and I went back to see him, guys, a few weeks later, uh, after starting Gleevec, I had a scan and went for my follow-up. And, and I will never forget, he was sitting there, this little khaki pants on with a cuff, I could see it so clearly, an arm on the break, these polka dot socks and this bow tie, white starch shirt, his hair all sleek bag like a GQ model. And he very nonchalantly told me that the cancer had spread to my liver. It was riddled with tumors. And basically, I don't know what you're going to do. And I don't know how you tell someone that and just sit and look at your socks and pick lead off of them. And I just stared at him. I couldn't even ask a question. I had already gone through the shock of being diagnosed, gone through the shock of surgery with an incision and being gutted like a pig, and then you put me on this medication and a few weeks later tell me, mm, oh well, <laughs> we maybe didn't need to do all of that, go and get your affairs in order. And I went and got in my car and I cried and I cried and I cried for about an hour until <laughs> mercy came through and someone called me and it was a very close friend who was able to help me drive home. And I thought about the phrase, you know, they're always telling people, live like you're dying. I am fairly certain that someone who was nowhere near death came up with that phrase, that is not a way to live. Fear, pain, anxiety. I have two sons, I have grandchildren. 
thinking about a funeral, who would be my pallbearers? Who wants to live like that? I may die while I'm living, but I will not live like I'm dying. So I, got, I became an advocate for myself. I realized this guy didn't know what the heck he was talking about. And I'm a healthcare provider. I'm a dentist, in case you're wondering about the Dr. Mo. But I realized that uh, my oncologist, I finally asked him, how many GIST patients have you had? And he said, one. Time for me to go. So I emailed a renowned physician researcher at MD Anderson. I kept running across his name in articles, uh, the Life Ref group, I kept seeing this name, and I, I won't say his name, but I called and they said he's not taking patients anymore. So I emailed him and I basically said, please help me. This doctor says there's, there's tumors all over my liver, there's nothing he can do, and, and I, am, I am not dying. You, you have to help me, I'll do whatever I have to do. And he emailed back, and it was the best email I ever got in my life. He said, oh, you probably have metastasis already, and the glebic is just causing the tumors to be darker, more radiolucent. And I can't tell you, sadly, how happy I was <laughs> to hear that. And so I, he said, send me your scans. What, who does that? Send me your scans. I'm not making a penny from this. I'm not your doctor. And it goes back to what Norm was saying about having physicians who are not arrogant, who are not obnoxious, who really, really care about us. I sent my scans. He goes, you're going to be OK. Stay on the clinic. Tell your doctor to call me. And I'm thinking, my doctor should have called you before he told me that I was dying. I'm not dealing with him anymore, so I would encourage you to be your own advocate. That's my story, but don't buy into the no one knows better. I've learned things just here this weekend. Just fight. Keep fighting. And so I kept emailing Dr. Benjamin, and he kept saying, I'm not taking any patients. Well, I said his name, but you guys don't know the <laughs> He's amazing. Anyway, uh, finally, he, he kept answering, but he was saying, I'm not taking new patients, and I can see why. He's quite, you know, he's a lecturer. He does all this stuff. So I said, well, hey, I, I understand that you're the number one GIST doctor in Texas. If you will not take me as a patient, who is the number two GIST doctor <laughs> in Texas? <laughs> and he emailed me back and CC'd his scheduler and took me on as a patient. The moral of that story being, don't quit. Uh, thank you. And I, and I wish it ended there that I was on 400 milligrams of Gleevec, and here I am today. But less than a year later, uh, a new recurrence um, around my spleen occurred. And they put me on suit, and blood pressure went through the roof. Uh, they put me on to Cygnus, to Varga, I had gastroenteritis, I had pancreatitis, I had a reaction, an anaphylactic reaction to CT contrast. It was just one hospitalization after another. In the meantime, I've got dumping sy syndrome, my hands are turning as black as this shirt, they're peeling, I got blisters, I know your pain. I know what you're going through. People look at us and they think, oh, you're fine, you're cured, you're in remission, they have no idea. No idea how hard it is just to get up some days. I even put ivory soap under my sheets to try to stop the cramps. That does not work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody else has tried that. When you're curled up like this, you'll do anything. And, and I love ivory soap, but it doesn't work for muscle cramps. So uh, eventually, we had to do another surgery, which you heard me talk about yesterday, a huge surgery. Uh, I remember the doctor saying, we're going to have to take your spleen in addition to some other things. And I said, I, I want my spleen. <laughs> and he said, well, you don't need your spleen. A lot of people don't have their spleen. And I said, who? The only people I know who don't have a spleen were stab victims and gunshot. I want my spleen. But sadly, uh, my spleen had to go. And I, I'm doing fine without a spleen. So. But it was just, it was just hard. It, it just seemed like every time I would get up and say, I can do this, I got this, here's my new normal, there was yet another thing 
yet another challenge on top of being a mother and a grandmother and a dentist and, and trying to carry on with my wonderful, charmed life. And so they did the surgery and I'm in the hospital and there are tubes everywhere, going up my nose, coming out my ears, my fingers, they even made holes in my stomach to drain this horrid looking stuff in my family. I think the hardest part of this is the way your family looks at you and the way your friends hug you for about 10 seconds too long and do that little pat on your back. <laughs> you know, it, that's the hardest part to me. It's not even the disease. It's, the pain and the worry of my family, and, and my goal is to make them forget what I cannot forget. And so I run. And six weeks later or so, after this surgery, I saw my doctor, my surgeon, and I said, I'm going to sue you. Those were the first words out of my mouth. <laughs> I had gone, folks, from a size eight, about 148, to a size zero. I was weighing about 110. And he looked at me and he had that look of astonishment like, I saved your life. Why on earth would you sue me? And I said, you know, I did sign the informed consent. And I agreed that you could take all of my stomach. I agreed you could take my spleen. I agreed you could take part of my pancreas. I agreed you could take my adrenal gland and do a ruin. Why? I don't know how I eat even now, but I do. But I did not agree that you could take my behind. <laughs> and he was like, what? Uh, a lot of women are happy that their butt went down. I said, not black women. They're <laughs> My best friend, Ressie, uh, is a triple D, and she, uh, and I had this, well, Kim Kardashian had the booty, has the booty I used to have. We would go to parties, and Ressie would come in like this, hey, and I would back in like this, because you work your assets, girls. <laughs> so now I'm an ironing board, I'm sitting on my pelvic bone, it hurt just to sit, who knew? And it's my humor and my faith in God that has gotten me through. But you know what? I, I can do this now, but I, I'll be honest. Sometimes when I'm home alone, I get so sad. I get so sad. The voices start screaming, and I think about what I used to do and who I used to be, and I start looking at pictures. But I have short pity parties. I could plan a pity party. I'm good at it. But they are short, and they are for one. Table for one. Anderson party and I cry and I get it over with and I get back on with the life that God has given me. I'll finish with this. My dad is a coach. Hi dad, my dad's and mom are watching me on Facebook. And I love my parents, my mother is a minister and they are so supportive and my dad coached for 47 years, everything. There was no specializing back in the day but he wanted me to be a track person because uh, I couldn't shoot, hit, or do anything else. And you can just look at me and tell I, I'm not an athlete, I'm not a track person. <laughs> but he made me, I, I was slow as cold honey, so he had, me do, <laughs> <laughs> he had me do a distance race, like that was going to be better. And I don't remember, it was an 880 or whatever, I don't care, I'll never run it again. And so I'm running, I'm running, I was doing my best. and. I was so slow that the girl who was in the front lapped me. I could hear my friends laughing up in the stands, and I just kind of ran off the track. <laughs> and went over and, and stuck my head in the long jump pit, just wanting to die. And my father came over and uh, found me, and he said, I'm disappointed in you. And I hung my head and I said, I know I, I didn't win. And, and my dad said, I'm not disappointed about that. I, I, you don't have to win, you have to be your best. He said, what did I tell you? And I said, you, you told me to run fast and pump my arms. And he goes, no, what else did I tell you? And I said, you said to run with my mouth open or close. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember, Daddy. And he said, think about it, what did I tell you? And I said, you told me to run until I finish. Run until I finish. It doesn't matter who else is running, how fast they go, how slow they go, what challenges they have to overcome. I run my race 
and I run until I finish. We have a very hard race, friends. I, I don't know why we were chosen to be in this particular race, in this particular lane, on this journey. It is hard, it is unfair, it is unfriendly. But what I've come to know is, it is not my family's race, it is not their fault. It is not my friend's race, it is not their fault. It is not my church's race, it's not my children's race, it is my race. It is my race and I will win this race because every morning I get up and I realize what a gift it is to open my eyes, to rise, to put my feet on the ground and stand. And then you know what I do? I run. I run. Thank you very much.